Okay, I'll just restart. So I'm pleased to be here to talk to you about my recent experience with adapting an open source uh, Markov model in R from the UK setting in order to explore a similar research question about testing for celiac disease in the Netherlands. And this is a project that I've been working on with my colleague Elske van den Acker and Howard Tom and Edna Kimi, who developed the UK model that we adapted, have also been involved uh, by advising us in the process. And Edna actually presented the UK model at the R4HCA workshop in 2021. So uh, the regular attendees should, should be familiar with it. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll first describe the process we followed in adapting the model with some examples. Uh, meanwhile, I'll reflect on some of the advantages and difficulties we experienced. And finally, I'll end with some takeaways that I hope will be helpful to others who may be planning to adapt a model in R. Uh, so there are some things to note first. So you can access the UK model with the link that I just posted in the chat. But you don't need to open the code for this presentation because I'll be sharing all the relevant parts on my screen. Uh, and since our study hasn't been published yet, I can't share the Dutch version of the code yet. But like I said, I'll show all the parts on my screen. Also, it may be relevant to mention that I've been using R for just over one and a half years. So I'll be presenting from that perspective. And therefore, this talk may be most relevant to those who are also relatively new to R or those who are uh, planning to adapt a model in R for, for the first time. And indeed, I think the whole experience of adapting an existing model is really a great way and a challenge to learn a lot about working with R in a short amount of time. So here's some background about why we chose to adapt an existing model. And in the Netherlands, we recently concluded the gluten screen project, which aimed to improve the early identification of CD by testing, asymptomatic, by testing symptomatic children aged one to four during routine visits at the primary care level using a new point of care test. And we wanted to investigate the cost effectiveness of such a case finding strategy and also mass screening compared to the usual care, which is basically opportunistic uh, clinical detection without any point of care testing. And the fact that CD is a chronic, largely undiagnosed disease, which is also a risk factor for other long-term complications, indicated to us that a model-based approach would be needed. And around the same time that we were preparing for our analysis, a similar research effort had just been finalized in the UK. So this team from the UK had just published the HTA, HTA report uh, that aimed to identify the optimum strategy for detecting CD in children and adults in the UK. And their cost effectiveness analysis was from a healthcare perspective and compared a similar usual care strategy as we have in the Netherlands, but it was compared to various lab-based tests, which didn't include the point of care test that we were exploring. Uh, but more importantly, the economic model that they developed was already informed by previous economic work and an extensive uh, review of the literature. So we thought that if it would be feasible to adapt the UK model to our decision context, then that would be a big advantage as we wouldn't need to uh, redo much of the good work that had already been done. So this brings us to the process we followed in adapting the model. And uh, the natural first step here was to just dive into the model to know exactly what we were working with and to then identify what adaptations were necessary. Uh, so with the HDA report itself, plus the relevant R scripts, we had enough information to detect all the changes we needed to make. And in the next slide, I'll present the main differences, but just to already mention that this initial step of exploring a model already highlights a major advantage of using R because the level of transparency it can offer is really something that we couldn't have uh, done without. And indeed, I doubt we would have been able to do this in Excel simply because it's a relatively large model and it would have been much harder to uh, know where to look or what sequence to look in. Uh, but with object-oriented programming, this goes almost naturally because you see all the relevant parts whenever you need to see them. So, for example, as soon as you see a new function being used, then that's your uh, signal to go and look at the script for that function or the help file. Um, so this format takes you naturally through the code in sequence, and it's actually hard to miss something if you just follow along. And now here are some of the main differences between the UK model and the adaptations that we made. So we were interested in a societal perspective instead of a healthcare perspective. We had a different test we were looking at. We also looked at fewer strategies. So our main analysis was just mass screening and case finding. Uh, we had a slightly longer time horizon and a younger population entering the model. Uh, then in addition, we conducted a scenario analysis where we tried to address a limitation that was in both the UK model and our model. And finally, we really tried to change and add any parameters that would improve the model's relevance uh, to the Dutch context. So this involved identifying any new data sources for several parameters, also where possible, including more cycle-specific parameters. And we also collected the data from approximately uh, 2,000 members of the Dutch Celiac Association. 
And in the end, only about uh, 10 out of approximately 60 parameters that go into our model remain the same as for the UK model. But despite these differences, the overall disease progression model actually remained quite similar. So as we can see here, so we, in both cases, we model a cohort of only CD cases that enter the model in different proportions of diagnosed and undiagnosed CD, depending on the specific strategy. Uh, and then both models assume that osteoporosis and non-Hodgkin lymphoma are potential long-term consequences of CD, and that the risk of developing them is higher for an undiagnosed case. And, and this is where you can see that we added uh, the new health state of gastrointestinal cancer. Uh, but before, so before I show the examples, I think it's helpful to broadly know how and when the various R scripts to run the analysis come into play. So we have a main R script on the right here, where among other things, we define the global settings, like the number of cycles that we number and we name our health states and so forth. Uh, and in addition, this is also where we create the objects that contain our model parameters and our transition matrix. And both of these are generated in functions in separate R scripts. And finally, the list with all of our model outputs is generated using this generate net benefit function, which itself calls several other scripts to actually run the simulation. And you can see here at the bottom that the simulation was optimized uh, using C++ to re reduce the runtime. Uh, but in general, this diagram shows how uh, the different R scripts will be relevant depending on the adaptations that you might need to make. So, uh, and in this context, the easiest type of adaptation that you could make, assuming that you're happy with a particular model, is uh, simply updating an existing parameter. So uh, that's actually my first example, <clears throat> where here we go to the model parameter script. And here I show how we changed the general population rates of, uh, and the increased risk of developing osteoporosis for diagnosed and undiagnosed cases. So uh, this R script defines a function that in the end will return a large data frame with all the model parameters that we generate. So in this case, in line 78, where we read into an Excel file that contains the general population rates of osteoporosis, uh, that's simply where we change the input file to read the Dutch population rates. And the only thing that we needed to be careful with here was that the structure of our new input file was compatible with the rest of the code. Uh, and then moving on, we also updated the log odds ratios for the increased risk of developing osteoporosis, as you can see in lines 86 and 87. So yeah, this type of change is really very straightforward because uh, osteoporosis was not a new parameter in, in the model. So we just needed to uh, change those, those input values. Uh, but now to go a step further, this next example shows how we added this new health state of gastrointestinal cancer. So going back to uh, the diagram here, the arrows are still the same, but the red dots are relevant to this example because that's where we needed to be mindful when adding our new uh, lines of code. And, um, and that's because to accommodate the, the new health state. And we could be slightly less concerned about the end state object in the blue box here, because that's uh, because the number of, of states is not a hard-coded number. So we only needed to change it on this main R script uh, but of course, still being mindful to check how uh, changing this number influences the other objects that we create, because uh, end states is often used to define the dimensions of, of new objects. But yeah, it's a slightly different story with the state names. So now I'll share uh, how we adapted the code for the transition matrices. So this is the script to generate the transition matrices. And here we define the function. And then early on, we defined this empty array with the dimensions of n samples, n cycles, and two times the number of states. And like I said, we don't worry much about the number of states because that's not a hard-coded number. But the aim here is to uh, complete this empty array with the correct transition probabilities at the correct cycles. So I'll skip to that here. This is where we're looping, um, where we loop over the cycles. And uh, well, this is the new health state. But here you can see that for a cycle, then you have a transition from one state to another, from one state to another. And at each cycle or age group, you're pulling the correct uh, transition probabilities. And you can already see that what you would need to do is simply repeat this exercise for your new health state, uh, just making sure that you're pulling the correct probabilities at the correct uh, age group or cycle, and uh, also adapting the other transitions that are influenced by this addition of the new health state. And uh, then you would redo this exercise with the cost and the qualities related to, to, the, to your new health state. Uh, so that's related to the 
adding a new health state, but actually a similar process needs to be followed when you're adding any new parameter. So for example, here in our approach to doing a societal perspective uh, was also quite similar, but in that case, we just needed to add this the new cost categories in the model parameter script, and then make the appropriate changes in the uh, state, uh, state costs, uh, as you can see here. So uh, here, this is for the productivity cost at each cycle, but you would, you would do this for any uh, new parameter that you, that you want to adapt. And finally, to the last example, this is about the scenario analysis, where we try to account for the presence of asymptomatic CD. So a limitation from both uh, models is that they don't distinguish between symptomatic and asymptomatic cases, because there's not enough information about asymptomatic CD. And not accounting for this actually favors any form of testing, because asymptomatic cases, you can imagine, make uh, probably make less cost and have a higher quality of life than uh, symptomatic cases. So in addition to this, the fact that our results showed that testing for CD was highly cost effective uh, indicated to us that this was an important limitation to, well, at least explore. So we made several additional and uh, on purpose rather extreme assumptions about an asymptomatic cohort to test if still both strategies would be still cost effective. Uh, so these are the assumptions uh, here on the right. And I'm ending with this example because it may be a good point for the discussion. And I'd be indeed interested to hear your thoughts on alternative ways to doing this analysis in R. Uh, but the way we implemented it in R was uh, simply by weighing the relevant parameters by the assumed proportion uh, of asymptomatic cases with their assumed uh, parameter values. So a cost of zero or a rate ratio of one. Uh, but the implementation of this weighing of the parameters was not completely straightforward because it actually differs depending on the strategy. So for example, with mass screening, you would already detect most of the asymptomatic cases before the model starts, and, and therefore they enter your model as diagnosed. And we uh, needed to weigh the values differently than we did with the no screening strategy, because there, most of the asymptomatic cases would enter as undiagnosed and subsequently cannot become diagnosed. So we needed to work out uh, how to weigh the parameters appropriately for each strategy. And uh, that was actually somewhere where we found ourselves using Excel again because of its interface. And you can see multiple changes in multiple cells at the same time. And that was, that was helpful for this, this kind of exercise. And then once we uh, worked out the calculations, we just transferred the code and the formulas to our R code uh, to run the analysis. So I'll uh, show this now. So this is what I mean here. If we take no screening, for example, and we focus on the utilities for children, then our assumption in the scenario analysis is that asymptomatic, diagnosed, and undiagnosed have the, have the Dutch uh, average utility. Uh, then these are the values that we used for the main analysis. And at the start of the model, you have a full cohort that enters as undiagnosed, uh, but we assume that 42% are asymptomatic. And then throughout the model, we assume that a proportion of the symptomatic cases becomes diagnosed just opportunistically. Uh, and that changes, obviously, the, the, the distributions. And Consequently, the utilities that we're using, uh, the weighted utilities also change. So we take the average of these uh, as the input utilities to a model. And this is what the corresponding uh, formula would look like in the R code. And then you would repeat this for any uh, parameter that you're including in your scenario analysis. But so you can see here how the values uh, change depending on the strategy. And what this meant is that we had to actually write three uh, model parameter scripts and then call the model uh, three times with the correct uh, parameters for that specific strategy and then combine it. So I'm showing that in this, in this uh, R code. Uh, so this is just like the main script. And then this is our input parameters uh, file for the no screening strategy. We run everything and then we only extract the outputs that we're interested in, which are the outputs for the no screening strategy. And then we repeated this with a different script for mass screening, again, extracting the outputs for the mass screening strategy. And then uh, once you've done this, once we did this for every, uh, for every strategy, then we could uh, run the scenario analysis using an adapted uh, net benefit function. And uh, that, that's, how, that's how we did it. Uh, so yeah, I'm aware that perhaps there's other or better ways to uh, have approached this. So I'm curious to hear what you think, but I'll just end with this last slide. Uh, so firstly, if, just to say that if you're starting off with R, then I, I do strongly recommend doing this type of exercise of adapting a model, especially if it's a model like this one, which didn't use too many packages and really forces you to understand the code more deeply. Second, I really think we would have struggled much more to adapt this model in Excel, 
uh, even following my own work in Excel can be time, it can be difficult. So let alone someone else's work. Uh, but in this case, we were even able to adapt to uh, get our model code checked by by others. And then, as a general tip for adapting a model, I would really recommend that spending enough time getting familiar with the code, as it can really become a painful process if you jump into changes too quickly. For example, I would say, especially try to understand. I'm trying to understand the dimensions of the objects that you are adapting. This is something that I spent quite a lot of time on. And a last small tip, which may seem obvious, is just not to change things that are not essential. So I would say, for example, uh, changing the object names should really be the last thing you should want to do, because that may just be giving yourself a lot of work later on to change it everywhere else. Uh, and also keeping the original object names is a good way to stay connected with the original model that you're adapting, uh, because as you make more and more changes, it's still good to, to stay, uh, to remember where, where you're coming from. So yeah, that's really all I have. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, very interesting and a lot of work obviously gone into this adaptation, which um, is always the case, but like you were saying, it, it may have some quirks in, in, in just moving to an adaptation done in R, but also gives you a lot of freedom like you should, because you can actually mix and match and, uh, and go into different things that you can do. So there are a couple of questions. There's a question on GitHub, but I think it's been answered in the chat. Then Sekar asked a question about currency and cost. Would you like to elaborate, Sekar? Currency and cost. Yeah, so actually in the we ended up adapting quite a lot of the cost data. So we we brought our own uh, our own cost data. So that was uh, not we didn't really need to convert uh, too many prices. But yeah, I, I also at one point when we still didn't have the, the Dutch uh, cost, I did. Uh, well, I, it's, it's also a nice example that just to write a short function that will uh, use uh, PPP to convert uh, the UK prices to, to the Dutch prices. Uh, so yeah, that's also really nice to, yeah, a, a nice advantage of our, I could have included that as an example as well, yeah. Then there's another question by Emma McManus. How much input do you get from the original authors of the model? Um, well, we've had, we, we had one uh, meeting uh, and then via email, we communicated maybe a few times. Actually, our last communication, uh, it was more, more at the beginning to get their input on how they did it, how they approached it, and then how what they think about what we were planning to do. And then at the end, once we've done it, uh, to get the code uh, checked and validated, we're using the advice uh, checklist uh, to, to validate the model and, and well, their ideal people to <laughs> judge whether the code is working properly. Yeah. Thank you. And then final question, perhaps by Mel, uh, who's interested to know by how much the RCPP function sped up the looping. Um, for those who don't know, RCPP uh, is a package that connects R to C++. C++ is a, is a more advanced language. So if you code things in C++, they're likely, and you do it well, of course, they're likely to be much faster and much more efficient. But you can still do things from R by linking your R code into C++ engine, essentially. And this that's exactly what this package does. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would actually pass this question to Howard because uh, I didn't write that uh, RC, this RC++ code, but it was already part of the model that we adapted. So we, we I mean, it's only an advantage to have it. Uh, so I guess uh, maybe for Howard can might want to answer that. Yeah, I'll just put it in the chat. Um, it's in the original model. It was a two to four times faster when we moved to a C++ loop. You can go faster with parallelization as well. Then we have one final minute for Hannah, who asks, how much time do you spend on adapting the code? Mm. Well, we've been busy with this project for around seven months. and. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I work on other projects at the same time. I, I don't know exactly how many or even a ballpark of how many hours, but it's been some a lot of full days. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. That was very, very uh, interesting. So um, thank you for all the questions. Uh, and I think.